some years ago, I did a book event in a suburban library. Given that most people who come to that kind of event are on the verge of getting a telegram from the Queen, I was surprised and delighted to see three teenage girls slumped in the front row. And um, when I expressed my pleasure that they were there to the librarian, she made a librarian's face. And she said, yeah, they're always hanging around here. I told them that if they liked it here so much, they could bloody well stay till closing time. I was their punishment. <laughs> I don't know what you've all done. At the end of the talk, I asked for questions. And one of the girls put up her hand. She had laddered tights and chipped black fingernails and her eyes were all smeary with eyeliner. And she said, so you've written a book, right? I mean, one before this. And I said, yes. And she said, so why did you need to write another one? <laughs> Beside me, the librarian inflated, I swear, like an enraged toad. But I actually thought it was a brilliant question. And I had to think about it before I answered. I told her that like most novelists I know, I'm greedy. It's not enough just to be me. I want more. I want to live all the lives I didn't get to live in all the eras I never got the chance to know. I want to be an apprentice engineer in Victorian London seeking a refuge from my nightmares in the sewers. I want to be an illiterate girl in Georgian England discovering the magic of books and the limit of superstition. I want to be a young, educated French woman traveling halfway across the world to Louisiana with my wedding dress in the hold of the ship to marry a man I've never even met. I want to wear their skins to feel the crackle of their fear in the roots of my hair, their excitement in the soles of my feet. For as long as I'm working, I can have these new lives. I can spend my days somewhere entirely other, losing myself in that place completely, and still, like Max from Where the Wild Things Are, get back to myself in time for supper. The only difficulty is choosing. There will always be more tempting places to slip through into history than even the most prolific novelist has time for. We That Are Left grew out of a conversation that I'd had with a historian friend of mine. He was telling me about how much the world had changed after 1918, how the cataclysm of that particular conflict had destroyed or transformed all the basic assumptions of Edwardian life, socially, culturally, politically, economically. Even the basic belief systems were in tatters. After something like that, how could anyone believe in God, in king and country, even in hope? We live in a world now where change is perhaps in some ways as rapid as it's ever been. But for all of ISIS and same-sex marriage and apps for everything, it still remains, for the most part, the world into which we were born. In 1918, people came stumbling out of four years of carnage into a world that would never be the same again. In Britain alone, nearly 900,000 men lost their lives. The devastating power of Paul Cummins' installation at the Tower of London last year lay in the fact that it, every single one of those hundreds of thousands of poppies was a story. Every single one, a husband, a lover, a father, a brother, a son, a space at the table that would never be filled. The post-war world was unfamiliar and treacherous, and so were the cobbled together lives of those who were left behind riddled with gaping holes where the boys who they'd let go to war should have been. So this was my question. What choices would we make? What would we do if all the assumptions that we'd grown up with, all the hopes and ambitions and deliciously imagined futures that we'd conjured for ourselves turned out to be just an illusion? That the, that the world that we saw waiting for us on the other shore of childhood, the world of our parents, what if when we got there, it didn't exist anymore? That was the question that haunted me. How did those who make it across redraw the shapes of themselves in sand that had not just been swept clean, but wiped completely off the beach? That question took me to some unexpected places. I knew a bit already about the social change, about the officers and the privates who were no longer willing to accept the conventional social divides, about the servants who'd found freedom working in industry and no longer wanted to go back to the bondage of domestic servitude. 
about the crippling death duties that turned the houses that they'd once worked in into white elephants. I knew about what the tabloid press, with its habitual sensitivity and aversion to sensationalism, called the problem of the surplus women. Uh, the Daily Express ran a headline of two million women who can never become wives. At least this provincial newspaper stuck to the facts. I knew a bit, too, because I'd written about it in a novel before, about the explosion in spiritualism after the First World War, the churches and the seances that sprang up across the country as grieving parents and families desperately reached out into the darkness to find those that they'd lost. I wanted to write about those people and also about the boys that nobody talks about, the ones that didn't fight, the ones who are unable or unfit or just too young to go to war, who were conscripted not by the army, but by parents, spouses, siblings, to fill the gaps that the dead ones had left behind. But the trouble with asking questions, as anyone with small children knows, is that every question leads to another, and you can find yourself very rapidly somewhere quite different from where you ended up. You can find yourself at physics. The Victorians thought physics was finished. After Faraday and Maxwell, they knew that there were I's to be dotted, T's to be crossed, but the exciting stuff, that they thought was all in chemistry. The only problem was that the physicists in the 1890s kept coming up with rather unexpected observations. With the development of the air pump, scientists were able to investigate air and other gases at very low pressures. When an electric current was passed through such a gas, physics found, uh, physicists found themselves seeing rays streaming off one of the electrodes. A scientist from Germany, Goldstein, dubbed them cathode rays, but what were they? Nobody knew. It was J.J. Thompson in Cambridge who demonstrated in 1897 that cathode rays weren't ra waves of radiation at all, but minute particles of matter emitted from atoms themselves. The atoms weren't, in fact, the smallest unit of matter, but contained much smaller bodies that Thompson called corpuscles, was so utterly startling that many physicists just completely refused to believe it. Their doubt was short-lived, though. In 1918, the great Ernest Rutherford... Ooh, I've gone too quick. The great Ernest Rutherford, who's pictured here on the right, um, devised an experiment which is still done today, using alpha particles. Alpha particles are the particles that spring spontaneously from radium, which had just been isolated by the Curies. And he used them as high-speed projectiles. He aimed a stream of these alpha particles at a sheet of gold foil. If, as Thompson had thought, atoms were plum puddings, was what he called them, spheres of positively charged energy studded with um, his negatively charged corpuscles, then the alpha particles should have passed straight through the foil. Maybe a few of them would have been slightly deflected. But instead, some of them came straight back. It was as if, Rutherford said later, he'd aimed a 15-inch shell at a tissue, sheet of tissue paper and found it bouncing straight back in his face. Rutherford had proved the existence of the atomic nucleus. The, the sign above his head, by the way, <laughs> was... This shows him later in his life at the Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge. It was put there when he arrived because he had such a booming voice <laughs> that it upset all the apparatus. <laughs> and he had to be reminded to keep it down. The war destroyed the pan-European collaborations that had driven rapid scientific progress before the war. Rutherford spent the four years of the war working on sonar. But in the years after the peace, it wasn't just the visible world that no longer conformed to the old models. On a subatomic level, too, physicists were busy proving that the old rules didn't work, that they simply failed to explain the realities of the physical world. Rutherford's experiments demonstrated that Thompson's corpuscles, which were now called electrons, orbited a positively charged nucleus. But the rules of classical mechanics said that this was absolutely impossible, that this, if this was happening, the atom would collapse within a thousandth of a billionth of a second. And it didn't. Atoms remained stable. The more physicists discovered about these atoms, the more mind-bending their conclusions were. The electrons in atoms, it turned out, didn't in fact just follow one orbit around the nucleus. They jumped spontaneously from one orbit to another, emitting energy as they jumped. 
more mind-bendingly still, though it was possible to predict pro in pro with probability, mathematically, when that might happen. There was absolutely no way of predicting when or in what direction an electron might jump. At a subatomic level, then, physicists discovered there was no such thing as cause and effect. It was this randomness that Einstein was so particularly opposed to when he said that God didn't play dice. He was sure that more and better work would prove that there was an orderly set of physical laws that governed this universe. But again and again, the experiments showed that at a subatomic level, it just wasn't true. It was these discoveries that led to the conceptual minefield that is quantum physics. You'll be relieved to know that I'm not planning to go into that tonight, mostly because my understanding of it is so com confused that anyone who knew anything about physics would have to come up and correct me on the stage. I read literally single paragraphs over and over again, and the words just slithered like eels from my grasp. In fact, I kept this quote above my desk. If you're not completely confused by quantum mechanics, you don't understand it. Lovely John Wheeler. John Wheeler was an American theoretical physicist who coined the term black hole. And the truth was I was completely confused, but I was also absolutely fascinated. It seemed fitting to me somehow that after four years of senseless slaughter, that the physical world too was declaring that the world was random at its most fundamental level. More than that, at, in a way that would probably horrify proper physicists, I found in this new atom a striking metaphor for the devastation of war. Across the country, families had had their nuclei ripped out, leaving the remaining family members to trace orbits around no center. What happened to those electrons or family members then? With the golden boy gone, what happened to the father who'd always expected to hand down his house or his business? To the adoring mother whose living children only served as a reminder of what she'd lost? Of the siblings who, for better or worse, had always lived in the shadow of their idolized big brother? These are some of the questions I set out to explore in my novel. And as I wrote and rewrote it over the course of a year and a half, I realized how much I'd learned from Rutherford, on whom I had actually developed something of a crush by this stage. Uh, Rutherford was a passionate experimentalist, and his experiments were always astoundingly simple. There was no money for physics in those days. His research students built their apparatus literally from sealing wax and string. In fact, he, they, he had to teach them how to blow their own glass so they could make uh, the specialized vessels that they needed for the experiments. And yet, it was in, oh, no, not jump too quickly. It was in this room, in this improvised laboratory, that Rutherford first knocked hydrogen nuclei, or protons, out of the nuclei of nit nitrogen, essentially turning nitrogen into oxygen and deliberately transmuting matter in a way that the ancient alchemists had only ever dreamed of. Rutherford was not a theorist. In fact, he had a very low opinion of these rock stars of physics. As physics got increasingly mathematical, he insisted that the truth was to be found not in complex equations, no matter how beautiful they were, but in the hard grind of practical experimentation. Theorists, he said, play games with their symbols, but we turn out the solid facts of nature. Over and over, he urged his students to look, to look and look and look, until they learned to see not what they expected, or worse, what they wanted to see, but what was really, truly there. No novel was ever improved by pages of undigested research, most of, which I, most of what I learned from all of this work ended up, of course, on the cutting room floor. But what did remain was a novel about being in love with science, in love with the rigors of really looking. Rutherford was famous for sitting down with his research students and saying, what precisely are you doing here? How? Why? And it occurs to me now that that was probably the answer I should have given to that girl in the suburban library by coincidence, only a few miles away from the laboratory where Rutherford did much of his most famous work. That fiction, at best, is a kind of experiment, 
a chance to take something we only half understand and examine it, to identify its essential properties, to expose its fundamental nature, to subject it, perhaps, to a bombardment if necessary, to see beyond what we think is there into the secret parts of the atom. Only in fiction, we're not investigating atoms. We're investigating ourselves. And why would anyone ever want to stop doing that? Thank you.